On April 15, 2018, a tornado struck Greensboro, North Carolina. With winds in excess of 135 miles per hour, power lines were torn down, houses were flipped upside down, and uh, foundations of homes completely uh, were shattered. It was a horrific storm, but through it all, there was one individual who sat still and remained focused. He was a teenager named Anton Williams. Anton Williams was sitting at home, sitting in his living room, and looking outside when all of the craziness began to take place. But he was so focused on the game that he was playing that he was unwilling to move. He began speaking to news reporters who learned about his story, and he said that while he was playing this game, he looked outside and across the street, roofs were being torn off and power lines were coming down, but he was not going to move. Rather than get up and leave, he was focused on what he was doing. He said there was only a couple people left. He had to finish his game. And so they kept asking him questions. They said, well, wait a minute, what about your safety? What about the people inside your home? And he said, honestly... I was just hoping that they would be safe because I had to win that game. Wow, can you imagine? Can you imagine sitting in the midst of a tornado and seeing your world just kind of uh, going crazy, but you're focused on a single game? I mean, who does that? Who does that? Who spends time focusing on a video game and just kind of loses track with the whole world? Well, the name of this video game is called Fortnite. That's right. <laughs> and it's a video game that's very, very popular. It's called Fortnite Battle Royale, and it is played by 125 million people all around the world. Uh, to date, it has made over $300 million, and it is very, very popular, to say the least. Uh, the game is kind of fascinating in the way in which it takes place because what happens is you get into a big bus along with 99 other people. And this bus has on top of it a hot air balloon and it lifts you up and it takes you to this island. And so you're in this, this big bus in this uh, hot air balloon and then at some point you have to jump off. And so you fly down, you land at a certain point on the island and then it is game on. It's a first-person shooter game, and so the last person standing wins. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very, very popular game. So before we go any further, I just want to kind of set the stage here and understand a little bit of context about uh, some of the people who are here. How many of us here this morning, by show of hands, either play this game or you know somebody who plays it regularly? Show of hands. Wow, look at that. Okay. <laughs> It is extremely popular. Well, you know what? You're not the only ones. Uh, in my household, I have two boys. They both love Fortnite, and they play it nonstop. Uh, they started playing earlier this uh, year, and it became like a game that they liked, and all of a sudden it was a game that they played over and over again. That's all they wanted to play. And they will play it with their friends. They will play, with their, um, play against each other. They'll play uh, on teams with each other. They'll play against their cousins in Texas. They will play this game nonstop. And then they want to talk about it always. They want to share everything about this game. And so they'll come and say to me, Dad, I don't know if you know this, but the new Fortnite season's coming out. Dad, I don't know if you know this, but there's a new accessory or there's this new costume. Dad, there's this guy at school. He plays uh, Fortnite four hours every night. I'm like, not impressed. And then he, and they're like, but Dad, he's won 150 get, wins. He's, he wins all the time. Okay, that's pretty impressive. But they, they tell me all these different things over and over again about this game that they love. People that play Fortnite love Fortnite. But what, you know what's fascinating to me about this game? What's fascinating to me about Fortnite is the business model, how they make their money. Because if you don't know anything about Fortnite, Fortnite is actually a free video game. You can play it on uh, the Xbox, PlayStation, PC, Mac. You can play it uh, on your phone. You can play it in all these different places. But the way they make their money is through accessories. 
And so you buy uh, different outfits. You customize the game in different ways. You can buy different weapons, or you can buy these emotes, which are like dances. And so if you see those kids out in the street doing these weird dances, probably a Fortnite dance, right? And so uh, there, there are all these things that you can do to accessorize this game. And as a result, this company has made a lot of money. Uh, games that typically might sell for $40, 50 or $60, they are getting on average $85 per person because of the money that people spend on accessories. Uh, that's pretty incredible. But it does kind of beg the question, why would anybody do that, right? Why would anybody spend so much money on this video game and just continue to spend more and more money? And so this morning, I want us to think about some spending patterns, all right? I want us to think about the way in which we spend our money because online video gamers aren't the only ones who make some questionable uh, purchases from time to time. Christians uh, do this as well. And sometimes we are just as guilty of spending money on things that uh, may or may, may, may not be all that important, all right? And so this morning, I want us to take a look at the topic of tithing and how we spend our money. Because here's what I uh, believe. Here's what the Bible teaches us. And I want to start with a, a statement, okay, that I want us to kind of explore uh, throughout our time this morning. And that statement is simply this, that our heart always follows our money. Do you believe that? Our heart always follows our money. And so if that is true, then what Jesus said is true, that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, right? And so I think it's important for us as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to examine this topic, to see where it is that we spend our money, to think about our own spending patterns and habits in order that we might understand who truly has a hold of our heart. All right, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me now to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, today we're going to be in verses 1 through 7, and if you'd like to follow along in those black Bibles in front of you, we're going to be on page 967. Uh, that's page 967. And if you'd like to follow along online, you can go to yourfountain.info, click on uh, the menu, and then click on the Learn link, and there you will find today's passage of Scripture along with a way to take notes. And as you turn there, let me just quickly remind you that uh, we are in a series of messages called Hot Topics, uh, in which throughout this summer we're talking about some difficult subjects. So far we've examined alcohol, racism, suicide. Today it's um, the issue of tithing. Next week we're going to take a look at homosexuality and transgender issues. You chose that topic, by the way. Uh, and the following week is divorce, okay? Okay. Now, a uh, quick uh, note, next Sunday, because of the sensitivity of that topic, I do want you to know that there will be a Fountain Kids option, okay? So if you have a young person, maybe not ready for that kind of a, of a topic, we will have an option for them. Um, but that's what's coming up, and so these are tough, tough subjects, and that's the purpose of this. We need to talk uh, about some tough uh, topics and some hot topics. So before we jump into our text, let me just give you an overview of what the Bible has to say about tithing, all right? And there's three truths that I want you to just think about this morning before we jump into this morning's passage of Scripture. And they all evolve around uh, this issue of tithing. The first one is this, that tithing was started before the law. Okay, so when we talk about the law of Moses and how the law was given to the children of Israel, tithing is actually found before the law. That's important. We're going to come back to that in, in just a moment. Uh, but tithing is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, we read of the story of Abraham and a guy by the name of Melchizedek. Abraham comes back after a victorious battle, and when he meets this man named Melchizedek, he discovers that he is a priest from a place called Salem. He is the priest of righteousness, and, uh, and so he blesses Abraham. And when he blesses Abraham, Abraham then gives to him a tenth of all that he had received from this battle that he had been in. And so he gives to him the, a tithe. And so the tithe is actually found outside of the law, okay? Again, hold that thought. Second thing that we need to think about within the Old Testament is the tithing was commanded within the law. 
And so fast forwards to the time of Moses. Moses receives the, the law from God, and God instructs his people to tithe. It was a part of the law. It was commanded by God, all right? Now, what's also interesting about that is scholars teach us that people in the Old Testament, the, the New Old Testament uh, Israelites, they would have had a couple of different tithes and even some free will offerings, such that their actual percentage of giving wasn't 10% each year. It was more like 23%. Okay, and so they were giving in, in a pretty big uh, amounts. And so there was a couple different tithes. There were some free will offerings. It was all part of the law that Moses gave to uh, God's people. That was a law that uh, held fast for hundreds of years. Fast forward to the New Testament. What do we discover well, what's interesting is there's not a lot of verses on tithing. There's not a whole lot that, that's even there. In fact, Jesus only mentions it three times. And each time that he talks about it, it's always in reference to somebody who's tithing, who's actually doing it. And so, uh, so it's not found in the writings of, of Paul. It's not found in the writings of John. It's found a few times in the book of of uh, Hebrews, but that's really in reference to that story of Melchizedek and, and Abraham and what it means. And so the question becomes, is tithing even for Christians? Do, tithe, do, do, do we as Christians even need to tithe? Do Christians need to tithe? Maybe the answer is no. Maybe the church should all write us a, a reimbursement check and we can all go out and buy uh, Fortnite accessories, right? Mm, no, 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 no. Hold on for a second, Okay. Because here's the principle that we learn uh, within the New Testament. That tithing was not removed from the law. And so when we get to the New Testament and we begin to understand the differences between the Old Covenant and New Covenant, we see that certain aspects of the law were fulfilled, right? There are certain things within the law that we do not do. But certain things continue. And one of them is tithing. So why did Jesus and the disciples not speak so much about tithing? Because it was expected. It was assumed. It was believed that if you're going to follow God, you're going to tithe. You're going to continue this practice. Nothing has removed it, and so tithing does continue. Okay, so short answer to the question, should Christians tithe? The answer is yes. But the New Testament goes on to describe our tithes and our offerings in a very different way. There are some things that, that which change, and a lot of it has to do with the way in which we view the money that we have received. Because in the New Testament, what we discover is that when Jesus is declared to be Lord, that means that he is over everything. He is the master. He owns you, and he owns everything that you have. And so tithing is the idea of giving 10%. Well, Jesus doesn't want to tip. He wants it all. All 100% belong to him. And so the New Testament talks to us about the needs to, to be generous with our money and to steward that which, that which we have received. Because what has been given to you and to me when we follow Jesus belongs to him. And so the way in which we use our money becomes very, very important. It says something about who we are. It reveals something about what's important to us. Our heart always follows our money. And Jesus made that very clear. And so this passage of Scripture we're going to examine this morning speaks to this idea of giving and generosity. Because in the New Testament, we read the story of how the Apostle Paul uh, wrote a letter to the church in Corinth. And as he wrote this letter to this church, he's going to begin to speak about some other churches who were doing some things that he's going to ch challenge uh, the church in Corinth to do as well. And so I want us to read and discover what those things were and see uh, what this has to say to us with regard to this issue of tithing and how we use our money. All right? So let's jump right in to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and beginning in verse 1. And let's see what Paul has to say. Uh, beginning in verse 1, we read, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. 
For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to the will of God, to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he has started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. All right, so let's stop and and think about what is happening here. Paul, remember, is writing to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians is the second letter that we have from Paul to this same church. And as he begins to write, he describes a situation, a need. And as we discover from other passages, what was going on in the first century is that the church in Jerusalem was in need of help. And so Paul, while he was on his third missionary journey, he goes to various churches, and as he does so, he begins to ask them for funds, for resources, in order that they might send those back to the church in Jerusalem. And so he spoke to these churches in this region of Macedonia. And notice what takes place here. I want you to notice the compassion of these people. Paul says that despite the fact that they were severely afflicted, that they were willing to give above and beyond their means. Paul even describes it as if they reached a point in which after they had, they had given their lives to God, they then gave their lives to, uh, to Paul and to Titus, and they were willing to give in such a way that they begged them to let them help. Did you notice that? That word beg is a very interesting word. It's the word in the original language, demonioi, and it's a word that uh, speaks of this idea of urging, of, of pledging, of, of being willing to do this, and it's found within a, a particular tense that's called the present tense, which means that they wanted to do it, and they ask over and over again. So the idea is this. Paul said, we have a need, and they said, let us help. And Paul said, oh, I don't know about you guys. Uh, there's... You need to probably keep that money. You, you probably ought to use that for yourself. And they said, no, no, no. We want to help, Paul. Please let us help. Please let us help. Please let us help. And they begged him over and over again. And finally, Paul said, okay, all right. And so he uh, allowed them to help. And what did they do? They gave so generously and so graciously that they just poured out their blessings And Paul said, look at this, church. He's speaking to the church in Corinth, but he said, look at these churches in Macedonia. And he raises them up and he says, look, they're like an example worth following. This is a church doing, these are churches doing some amazing things, some things that you ought to be doing as well. And he begins to challenge them in this passage of Scripture. And so notice the challenge that he lays before them. He says, you're growing in lots of different ways. You're growing in your faith. You're growing in your your speech and your knowledge of God's word. But I'm raising this up, and I want you to grow in the graces that these people are growing in. Grow in this grace of giving. And so Paul challenges this community to become generous, to become a, a community of generous givers. You know, the online gaming community, as I uh, discovered, is actually a a community of very generous people. I learned about a a very famous professional video game player, a guy by the name of Tyler Blevins. Have you heard of him? Maybe you've heard of his uh, screen name. He's called Ninja. And so if you're a video game player, you probably have heard about this guy. Uh, He's pretty famous, maybe the most famous professional video game player in the world. I didn't even know that existed until just recently. But yes, you can make a living from playing video games. But this guy's story is pretty fascinating. Uh, He grew up playing video games and watching his dad play video games. He said that his dad used to play late at night when everybody went to bed, and then when he would go off to work the next day, he and his brothers, they'd get up and they'd start playing, and he always wanted to be as good as dad and as good as his brother's. Uh, but his brothers wouldn't let him play because he just wasn't good enough. So he kept working and trying to get better and better, and before long, his brothers wouldn't let him play because he was too good. He started playing a game called Halo. Maybe some of us have heard of that if you play video games. 
And he became uh, very, very good at Halo. Started going to different tournaments. Started winning lots of money. Started getting sponsorships. And pretty soon, he became a professional video game player. And today, he makes $500,000 per month. I didn't think that was possible. So I, when my boys told me that, I said, no, no, that can't be possible. So I went and did some research. Uh, it's true. $500,000 per month playing video games. And you know how he does this? Because of the generosity of people within that community. People give him money to watch him play. Imagine that. Some of us are like, I have no idea what you just said there. Yes, they give money to watch him play video games. It's incredible. And they will use these streaming services like Twitch and different things in order to make money. And so he has learned that he can make an income and make quite a good income at this. But he's also a very generous individual. And earlier this year, he participated in a, a fundraiser in which he raised $100,000 for a suicide fund. Just this past week, he uh, participated in another event, which he's hoping to raise $250,000 as well. And many within that gaming community are the very same way. They play these games, they go to these conventions, they will make money, but they will also give a lot of money away. I started thinking about this. This community of online gamers, known for their generosity. And I started wondering about the church. Is the church today in the United States of America known for its generosity? We have people that are generous. I'm not saying that Christians aren't generous. But is the church as a whole known for its generosity? Well, let me share with you a few statistics on tithing just alone, all right? Right now, in the United States of America, only 10 to 25% of those who are Christians tithe. That's like 1 in 10. There's the average person uh, gives about 2%. That's way below 10%, all right? Even if 10% was the bar we're going for, which it's not, but even if 10% was, that's way below. It's also very interesting that Americans gave more money per person in the Great Depression than they do now. Now, that's specifically to Christians, but still, really? How can that be possible? When you think about our country and you think about the wealth that we have and the wealth that we all have, and all of us, uh, by the world standards, are pretty wealthy, how can these things be? Well, it's not because of a money problem, right? We all have money. It's a heart issue. And our heart always follows our money. Your heart and mine always follows our money. And where we place our money and what we spend that money on and the things that we're involved with, that's the way in which we show what's important to us, right? And while there's nothing wrong with buying certain things or enjoying certain things in life or doing certain things with your, your friends or your family, if that's what we invest in, if that's what's most important, if that's where our money goes, it does say something about what's important to us, right? Our heart always follows our money. And whether we want to admit that or not, that's true for all of us, myself included. And so when we stop and we think about Jesus... When we think about what he has done for us, we realize that Jesus became poor so that we could become rich and that Jesus wants us to use the things that he has given to us in a particular way. And that's why Paul says what he does in, in chapter 9, in verses 6 and 7. Paul takes this issue of, of generous giving and all these things that he is saying within these chapters and he summarizes it here in these words. Notice what he says. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Those two verses are challenging, challenging for all of us. 
Because what Paul is saying is that when you and I sow sparingly, we can expect very few rewards when we leave this world. But when we sow bountifully and we are investing in the kingdom of God and we recognize that all the things that God has given to us actually belong to him, then when we leave this world, we will reap rewards that look very, very different from some of the rewards that some will receive. And Paul says that God loves a cheerful giver. God is looking for people like those churches in Macedonia who see a need and they say, let me give to it. No, 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 not you. I want to be the one they, they, who, who argue and get fired up about giving towards a need. And yet that's so foreign to so many of us. And yet is that not a picture of Jesus who willfully went to the cross for you and for me? So this morning, I want us to take a step back and just think about uh, what Paul is, is trying to say. I want us to, to stop and think about this within our own lives. I want you to examine your spending patterns as I examine mine. I want to give to you some, some goals. The Bible doesn't talk about in the New Testament commands regarding this area, right? Each ought to give according to his heart. God wants us to examine our heart and see how we should use our money. So what I want to share with you this morning is not commands. I don't want you to leave and say, oh, no, I got to do these things. No, 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 these are goals, okay? Things to think about. Things for you and I to think about as we think about our resources and our money. So here's the first one. Tithe to the local church. I want to challenge you to just tithe to the local church. Take your income, whatever it is, take the first 10%, give it to the church that you belong to. Give it to the church that you want to be a part of. Give it to that group of, of brothers and sisters in Christ. When Paul wrote of those, that, those churches in Macedonia who were giving, you know, right, if they were willing to give the way, in the way in which they were to people they had never met before, they had to have been taking care of their own. And so I think that that is a good principle. I think that you and I can think about who is around us and the churches that we are currently a part of and say, if that's my church home, I want to invest in that place. And if you consider this your church home, I want you to, to consider tithing here if you're not currently doing so. And I want you to know where your money goes. When you give money to Fountain Town Christian Church, here's how that is used. It's used to pay for staff. It's used to pay for uh, ministries. It's used to pay for uh, building expenses and just general things that we need as far as upkeep of, uh, of, and maintenance. But it's also used to tithe as well because we take this principle very, very important. Uh, we see it as very important and significant to the church family. 10% of whatever you give to us is then sent out to, uh, to the rest of the world given to local organizations, given to, uh, to different places. And so we take the money that you receive, and we don't want to keep it all. We use that uh, for the things that we need, but we also tithe that as well. And I've even talked to the elders about growing that percentage. There's nothing that says we have to stay at 10%, right? Why not become a church that gives 15 20%? If God has blessed us, let's keep giving it away. But I think that's a good goal if you're not there, to start there and to tithe to the local church. Second, Give to the regional church. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean the, 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 the churches in our area. When you see needs and opportunities that you can help and God places it upon your heart to, to help them, do so. Let this church know how we can help other churches. Listen, we're all in this together, right? If a church today in, um, in Greenfield or New Powell or Morristown or Shelbyville reaches somebody for Jesus, we all celebrate we're all in this together, so why not help those churches in this area when you hear of needs? God places that upon your hearts. Help out those local churches. And third, support the global church. Support the church that is the capital C church. You can do that through prayer. You can do that financially through supporting mission organizations and missionaries. You can go on mission trips yourself, right? But we need to, to think about this in, in a way in which we start with that which is around us. And, and like those churches from Macedonia, we take care of our own. But then as we think about the region, we're like, uh, the, like the region, he called them the Macedonian churches. He wasn't talking about specific churches. So those regions of churches were taking care of one another. But then when they heard of another uh, need in the Jerusalem with believers they had never met, they said, let's give to that too. 
I think that pleases the heart of God. I think that God doesn't command us always to do these different things, but I think that these type of of ideas help us, right, because it encourages us to be like Jesus and to give this life away. When we give away this life, we receive that which we cannot earn, eternal life. And we need to realize that the one who laid down his life for us turns to us and says, now lay down your life for me. And that includes all areas of our life. And all of us needs to examine this area of our finances and stop and think about what God may be saying to us this morning with regard to our spending patterns. Because our heart always follows our money. You know, this past Thursday, something pretty important took place within the uh, Fortnite community. Uh, maybe some of you heard of it. At uh, 4 a.m. on Thursday uh, morning, season five of Fortnite came out. And people were just going crazy for this, right? Some of them woke up in the middle of the night and just immediately started downloading it. And they had to see what has changed, what's going on, what's new. And so they looked at the map of Fortnite, and they realized the different regions have kind of changed, and they did some things here, and they added some new features, and they, uh, they have some new characters that are different, and you can do some different things, and so people were fired up about that, and they began to start playing. And when they began to start playing, uh, more and more people began to play together, and recently they broke their record for the most people playing one game at the same time. And uh, the, the number of people that were on their servers at one time was 4 million people. Think about that. 4 million people all gathered together playing one game, playing the, uh, the same type of game, obviously different games, but the same game all at the same time. That's, that's pretty incredible. I, st- I was thinking about that. I began to think about you and me. All these people gathered together at the one place at one time in order to, to play this, this game, in order to win, right? I think that's a beautiful picture of the church. The church of Jesus Christ comes from all different parts of the world. They gather together in all kinds of different locations. But they do so with one purpose, with one goal. They want to win. They want to accomplish the mission that God has given to us, right? Right? And when you and I stop and we think about what God has done for us, and we think about all the things that he has done for, for you and for me, we think about the resources that he has given, God wants us to use that, to pool that together in order to do amazing things for him and for his kingdom. And God wants us to use our finances in a way that will honor him in a way in which we will uh, understand what Paul said, that when we sow sparingly, we will reap sparingly, but when we sow bountifully, we will reap bountifully. And when we come before God and we recognize these truths, and we have a cheerful heart, and we lay down our wallets and our checkbooks and our credit cards before God and say, God, what do you want me to do with these things? And God begins to speak into our lives and begins to show us how to use the resources that he's given us. We begin to look very, very differently. We become a a group of people who look a lot like those churches in Macedonia. A group of people who don't see giving as a burden. They see it as an opportunity. They say to themselves, what can I do to help? Jesus, what do you want me to do with the money that you've given to me? And so this morning, as we stop and we think about all of these things that are found within God's Word and how Paul wrote to this church, challenging them to follow the example of these other churches, I think we need to stop and think about our hearts, how we're spending our money, and whether or not Jesus has hold of our hearts or not. Because our, our money uh, always leads, right? Our hearts always follow our money. And if Jesus has that, then our hearts will follow. And this morning, we need to, to stop and to consider that. And so I just want to leave you with this challenge. If you want to live like Jesus, you need to give like Jesus. You need to recognize that the things that he has given to you need to be used in such a way that you 
honor him. And you demonstrate who you are by the way you and I spend our money. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, as we come before you uh, this morning, God, I just stop and I pause and I thank you for difficult truths. Today we talk about uh, tithing and offerings, giving. And God, as we all look at our finances, I know that there are decisions that we have all made, myself included, where we say, mm, I don't know if I should have spent that much money on that thing. And yet the purpose this morning and the purpose that, that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth was not to be a guilt trip, but was to, to challenge all of us, God. To help us to see that uh, our money does say something about where we are spiritually. And so God, would you speak into the hearts and minds of every single person who is here. We have some amazing people here this morning who have a heart for giving. And we all need to, to grow in this area. And so, God, would you begin to reveal where we're at, help us to understand what our money and how we spend it, what it really says, and help us to, to really understand where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. Jesus, we trust you. We love you. Everything is yours. We want to give to you not 10%, but 100%. You deserve it all. And so we love you and we praise you. We pray all of these things in your powerful and holy name. Amen. Amen.